Can I say thank you to Antonia for being brave enough when she said, would you come and share some time in Guildford Diocese? And I said, can I come for a few days? <laughs> and she sort of went, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for trusting and having belief in me uh, that I could come and spend time with fellow members. As a worldwide organisation, to be your worldwide president is an incredible joy, a wonderful privilege. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for the last five years of your faithfulness through your prayers, through your encouragement. And I want to assure you that although I don't pray for you all by name, I do pray for you. I pray for you daily. And I really feel sad when somebody comes up to me and says, hello, Lynn, and I can't say, hello, using the Christian name. And then somebody said to me, well, actually, Lynn, we know you because your face is everywhere. <laughs> you don't know us because we pass. But please be assured that I do pray for you and I pray for the work that you've enabled, the work that you continue to do. Now if this works, I will thank the Lord even more. A question for you all. What is the Lord asking of you? What is the Lord asking of you? We've had a celebration of a 102nd birthday, and I'm sure if we sat and had a conversation with Flora, she would tell you all the wonderful things that has enabled in her life, in her membership. What is the Lord asking of you? Next year is election year. Next year, all things will be changing. Next year, what has the Lord in store for you? Our founder, that amazing lady, Mary Sumner, a woman filled with faith, hope and love. Those of you, and I know you all know the story, our first meeting almost didn't happen. And yet, 141 years later, we are here as her witnesses, thanking God for what he enabled. And I'd just like to read to you something, a letter that was um, sent uh, by the, the then Archbishop of Canterbury upon the death of our founder. What a wonderful life it has been. Few of those who realise the work of her later years know or remember how early she began to have large responsibilities and a central position, wherein her charm carried so much before it. How gallantly she bore a yet greater burden in the after years, but with self-same charm everyone knows. Her praise is deservedly in all the churches. People seldom see the fruit of their labours, but life has allowed it for one woman. It is a marvellous experience to have first discovered a new way of dealing with quiet home problems and stirring people there too, and then to have lived to see it come true all over the world under her ripe experience. She has gone to her rest and her reward and we can all thank God for the devoted service of our long years. It is thanksgiving that it is a dominant note. Words of a leader of the church who knew, 
who worked alongside, who saw the difference that our founder began and encouraged others to be the hand of Christ in their community. A leader who saw in another the change that could enable and be enabled. Earlier this year, I was in the United States and I was taken to uh, Virginia College and it's a seminary where ordinands study. And there was this beautiful sculpture and it's a, a vision of Elizabeth and Mary, the visitation, where Mary shares the news to Elizabeth. This statue really moved me to tears. Look at the face of Elizabeth. That older face, that worldly face, but she's reaching out her hand to the young Mary. She's saying to her, I will walk the journey with you. I know there are great things happening in your life. That's what I feel that is depicting. She is so worldly wise, Elizabeth, and yet she knows the pain and the suffering. Mother Union, faith, hope and love. 83 countries around the world, a membership of 4 million. And in every community that there is a Mother's Union, we are trying to be Christ-like. We are trying to be there for families and communities. Not occasionally, but every day. Every day, striving to change lives. Our sisters around the world, Sisters in Christ overcoming challenges. There's a, a picture, the group picture, is when I visited South Sudan. South Sudan, so many problems, so much conflict, so much war. For many years we've, we've all heard and seen it on our television screens. And yet, these ladies meeting together Reverend Rebecca has done so much work for many years for Mother's Union and she's gone that extra mile. And I said to her, is this your home? And she said, home is where I lay my head. I was not born here. I was born in another village. But the soldiers came and we had to flee. I don't know if my family are still alive. For many days, we hid for fear of our lives in the bush. I don't know if I'll ever see my family again, but I know God in his heaven will be, will be protecting them wherever they are. Around, around me were, were women who had really struggled because they had been abused by soldiers. Gender-based violence, very much part and parcel of that community, of those communities. Is it fair in this world that there is such a thing as gender-based violence? In a world where we say that as members we try to show God's love? I would love us all to be able to stamp out as members of our union gender-based violence, to stand up and speak out many forms of gender-based violence. We read about it, but do we actually do anything? Do we actually challenge? Do we actually say, this is wrong and something needs to be done? Reverend Rebecca washed my feet as I entered, reminding me of the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And she said that she had to be the servant. You and I 
have to be the servant in our own communities. I am your servant. I am here to serve. I hear about the work. That's why I like to come to diocese and find out what you're involved in. I can then share your stories with people that I meet. But I am your servant and I'm here to serve. Harriet on the other side, a wonderful community development coordinator, supported by you and by me and by fellow members. She knocks on the door of government and says, gender-based violence and inequality, especially for women and children, is wrong. What are you going to do about it? She is so brave speaking out in her community. And I hope and pray that you, in your turn, will speak out against injustice. When I was in Zambia, the provincial president told me that the members were going to have a walk of witness. And I said, great. I said, where are we going? And she said, oh, um, well, it's a three-mile walk, Madam President. Are you capable of walking? <laughs> and I said, you put me in that line and I'll walk. So she smiled and she said, well, I'll have the car at the back in case you get tired. <laughs> I've got to say, ladies and gentlemen, I made it. <laughs> but what was wonderful was this walk of witness. You could see people on the sides of the street and asking each other, what's going on? What was even more fun was several of the members didn't think the worldwide president would be walking, so they would stand on the side of the street as well. So quickly sharing what Mother's Union was about and thinking, oh my word, the worldwide president's walking, we better walk. And the walk of witness got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was an amazing celebration. The banner should have been at the front, but then I was told to walk in front of the banner. But then I was told to slow down because the band couldn't keep up with me. <laughs> I did try. The first lady of Zambia was one of the speakers and she got out of the car and could see this procession and she'd realised because she'd been told that the worldwide president was also walking and she gently stepped inside and sat, stood beside me and she said, it'll look as if we both walk together, won't it? <laughs> but she heard the stories. She heard the real problems. And I invited her to think about ways that perhaps she could speak with those in authority. And I've heard since my visit and that was last year, but I've heard that she's getting more and more engaged and challenging and encouraging members to challenge with her. And I praise God for that. I do praise God. She listened and it went on her heart and she acted. The picture with all the mass of ladies was in Harare, in Zimbabwe. And there was going to be a big celebration service. Archbishop Justin was there. And it just coincided that I was also there. Um, so we would meet at different things um, in, Zim uh, in Zambia and in Zimbabwe. And he actually said, we make a good double act, you and I, don't we? <coughs> there was a dinner. <coughs> And the MC decided that um, everybody in authority would dance before the food was served. And I worked out, eventually, I'm going to be asked to dance. And suddenly I heard over the microphone, Mother of the Worldwide Mothers Union, you are sitting there smiling. It's your time to dance, otherwise your, your daughters will not be fed. 
So I thought, right, okay, I'll stand up and I'll dance. And one of the ladies said, you're going to have to come back and we're going to have to teach you how to dance properly. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, beside me, was Archbishop Justin. And he said, I thought I would dance with you. He said, it's a bit like in the dentist's surgery. You know it's going to happen, and you'd rather it was done quicker than later. <laughs> so there is a picture somewhere of Archbishop Justin and myself dancing. No, I won't say. <laughs> I better not say what I was going to say. In Rwanda, oh, sorry, I'll go back to the picture. Uh, I got sidetracked. Um, and I was taken in a vehicle, and as we entered um, the field, suddenly the word went round that the worldwide president of the Mother's Union was in the vehicle. To be surrounded by so many members singing and dancing and thanking God for safe travel. Actually, Antonia, you know, I'm disappointed. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> Ladies, can we dance? <laughs> I'm joking. <No. laughs> but it was a wonderful sight. It was a wonderful witness. And if you think of, of Zimbabwe and all the richness and all the resources it has, and yet the struggle those people have, not their own <coughs> fault, the fault of others, and they struggle, and they are in pain, and they are suffering. Please, I encourage you, as you pray, pray that the world will be a better place. The world will have and enjoy equality. The world, the wonderful resources that God has provided us, the amazing resources, one day will be equally shared amongst all. In Rwanda, I was taken on a Monday morning, very early, to the genocide site. And I saw pictures, horror pictures, of little ones, of older members, of older people who had been massacred. And to see pictures of piles of bodies on the roadside really was very painful and very difficult. I was born in, in Cumbria and in 2001 we had foot and mouth. I saw cattle and sheep piled high and that was painful. David, my husband, is a parish priest and in one of his parishes, it was a, he had seven parishes, in one of his parishes, out of 77 farms, 71 were affected. So to see this huge pile of cattle for days was horrendous. But to see the pictures of children and of men and women piled high there was an awful lot of tears shed that day. But the great joy is that in 1995 there was, there was that pain and that suffering. And in 2017, communities are working together because they never, never want to face that again. They've learned, they've learned from the pain of the past, moving it to the the peace of the present, to move it on to the hope in the future. They have a way to go, but they are getting there. And it's your fellow members, in many, many instances in the communities, that are sitting down and talking and sharing about peace in a, a world that they've known as painful and reconciling reconciling to each other, reconciling to God, and reconciling to self. So please, again, I, can, I ask you, I urge you to pray for Rwanda and places of conflict. We don't know what it's like. 
I don't know what it's like, but I saw the pictures and they're in here and they're in here. And I can only share them and share my thoughts with you. Your fellow members have seen things that nobody should see and experienced things that nobody should see. But they get on and they do. Celebrating decades, 13 decades of service, this year all Ireland has celebrated 130 years of faithful witness. And Phyllis, the All Ireland President, shared this with me and she said, I'm on a pilgrimage lane, 12 dioceses, and I'm going around. And I said, oh great, I said, I'd love to come with you. And she said, right, okay. Well, um, we're starting on the Sunday and we're finishing. I went, oh, hang on. Uh, I can only come Wednesday to, to, to Sunday. She said, that's okay. She, we can do eight dioceses. <laughs> so in four days, we pilgrimaged around four, uh, eight dioceses. We didn't actually because I went out of the door and was taken in a car to the next diocese. So I cheated. Um, but again, to be with the members, to walk that journey of celebration, thanking God for all that have been enabled in that wonderful country. And as we all know, it's also been a painful country in past. But again, seeing the unity, celebrating in the rain. And it was an interesting day because we were in Derry and Reform. And we went in and one of the ladies said, Ooh, it looks as if it's going to rain. And another lady said, no, it is going to rain. <laughs> By golly, when we came out, it was raining. <laughs> Are you still happy to walk the walls? And I said, Are you walking? And this lovely lady said, yes. I said, well, I'm coming with you. So we had umbrellas. A bit difficult talking to people with a big umbrella. Um, so we shared umbrellas, but that was just taken as a photo shot. But that was a wonderful experience because standing on the Peace Bridge, I shared with a member about the pain and suffering of the loss of a child. Those of you who, who know about the project work of the neonatal and stillborn babies, the gowns and the shawls that many dioceses are involved in, she told me about the story of her child and how it was not possible for either her or her husband to talk about the pain of loss. I shared with them the story of James, who I met on a train. And it was lovely because we were sat chatting and um, he looked at me and he said, you've got papers out for Mother's Union. He said, how is the old organisation? I said, well, it's not so old. I said, well, yes, it's a few years old. I said, but it's still vibrant, it's still needed, it's still necessary. And he said, yeah, right. He said, um, my mum was um, oh, an enrolling member. I said, branch leader. He said, right. He said, so where have you been? Why have you got the papers out? So I said who I was. And he looked up at the ceiling of the train. He said, mum, you'll never guess I'm sat next to the worldwide president. <laughs> And we chatted, but what was great was he said to me, you know, I'm surprised I've got any hair. It been his mid-late thirties. And I said, why? He said, well, all the ladies, when I used to go to the meetings, used to rub my hair and say, hello, James. <coughs> so tell me, what's the Mother's Union involved in? So I started sharing some of the worldwide work and some of the projects at home. And I talked about the gowns and the shawls. And he got upset and he said to me, I never thought I would be able to say thank you. He said, we wanted our third baby. Sadly, it wasn't meant to be. She came through the door, <coughs> wrapped in love. And it was the love of the Mother's Union. Please thank your members, the initiatives that you do, 
the programs you're involved in, whether they're big or small. He said, they'll never know the difference they make. He said, but people who receive certainly will. So on behalf of James, and all Jameses around the world and around the corner, I say thank you for all the work that you have done in the past, all the work that you do currently, and all the work I know that the Lord will be asking of you in the future. I don't know when Trish was worldwide president, if she got to plant a lot of trees around the world. There's trees all around the world planted by me. <laughs> and this one in Ireland is no different. When I was in Congo, I was invited to visit a prison. Now visiting prisons in Britain and Ireland is one thing. But visiting prisons in Congo is something very different. To have 200, over 200 men quite close to you is very difficult. But I knew I had to do it. I knew fellow members, your fellow members, go into this prison on a regular basis. They take in rice to share with the, member, with the men. But they also take in something wonderful, which is the word of God, and they share the Bible and the stories of the Bible. And they say to the inmates, tell me about your family. Let me pray for, your, for you and your family. And know that until I come next time, I will be praying constantly reaching out wherever God has placed us, vitally, vitally important in the big and in the small. I was a bit anxious and I said to the governor, what do you want me to do? And she said, the, the men are just so proud that you've come and they can't believe that you want to say hello to them. Give them some words of encouragement, but importantly, pray for them and with them. And that's what I did. It was also a women's prison and it was separated by a curtain. And I said to the women, are you safe in here? And they said, well, no. The men come to us and we can't fight them. So even in prison, those women are not safe. About 40 to a cell. How are they enclosed? By a curtain. So there is so much that we could pray for. We could, we could, God would never cease to hear us. And I do hope and pray that you will pray for your fellow members in Congo. When I was in the USA, I visited um, a warehouse uh, that's all I can describe it as. And it was um, a warehouse that um, collected food for those who were struggling financially. And somebody said to me, actually, Lynn, that picture looks very typical of you playing. And I said, well, actually, I'm actually filling bags with oats. Oh, she said, I thought it was a water game. <laughs> and what they do, they have a bag, a plastic bag, and they fill it with two scoops of oats or two scoops of pasta or two scoops of rice and seal it and then make a little box and give it to the families with other things in. Basic essentials that are an available um, with different ideas and it enables families to be fed. In Australia, I know Australia is big, but I hadn't appreciated just how, how big and how vast that beautiful country is. Members struggle because of distance. We say 
oh, well, we're not coming because they say it'll take us a couple of days, but we'll get there. Really different ideas. They do struggle because Mother's Union is not as well known. I think that might be similar in some parts of England as well. Mother's Union isn't well known. Kate, the young girl on, on, in the picture, was very passionate about our work. And I said, how long have you been a member? And she said, I'm not a member. And I said, oh, why not? And she said, well, I've never been asked. She said, but I'm busy. And I said, well, you know, it's great if you would consider. And she said, I know about the aim and, and object. I know about what you're trying to achieve. I know the work of the worldwide organization. But is it for me? And I said, it's for everybody. Baptised in the name of the Trinity, promised to support the aim and objectives. She said, but I can do that and I believe that. I said, do you believe it here or in here? And she said, I actually believed in here. I said, well, I would love to admit you as a member of the Mother's Union. I'll think about it. I said, that's okay. And she turned and stopped. <coughs> and I just put my hand on her shoulder. And I said, shall we have a prayer? And she said, yes, please. And we had a prayer. And she said, I want to walk the journey with fellow members. <coughs> Our founder in 1876 saw a need. Victorian England, 2017, we are not in Victorian England. We need to remain relevant. I was in a diocese uh, last year in, in these islands and I said to the ladies, We also need to be realistic. Our founder in 1876 saw a need. Victorian England, 2017, we are not in Victorian England. We need to remain relevant. I was in a diocese um, last year in, in these islands. And I said to the ladies, um, you know, tell me some of your work, outreach work. And this lady said, well, you know, we've done this particular project, she said, for 40 odd years. And I said, all oh, right. She said, in fact, she's Mary, somebody told us to do it. <laughs> and I said, okay. And she said, but it, we don't get any, any volunteers anymore. In fact, we don't have any outreach anymore. In fact, it's a long while since we received um, somebody to enable the project to, to be reaching out. And I said, okay. I said, so why are you doing it? She said, well, we've got to. <laughs> and I said, but who's benefiting? Um, nobody. And I said, well, perhaps you need to step back and reflect. And if it's finished, if it's run its course, thank God for it and hand it over. And somebody else will give you an idea and you move forward again. And she said, yeah, but what would Mary Sumner say? <laughs> <laughs> Need to remain relevant. We are a global family. And as a worldwide organisation, We also need to keep up to date. Our constitution was last, last fully updated in 1995. Since then, there's been nine minor changes and amends. The world has moved on. The Mother's Union family has grown. Belief and passion, my belief, 
the belief and the passion of the trustee board. We need to recognise this. A belief that the constitution is important. Also that the consultation is important. And I do thank Antonia and her fellow trustees and indeed the leaders around the world for being willing to be part of the consultation. This organisation has always, and please God always will be, member-led and member-governed. But it's no good changing things if we're doing something totally wrong and totally different from what the membership request and require. So by consultation, by a conversation, we have moved things forward. I am one of very few worldwide presidents around um, because of the, the, the virtue of, of the, the position. Um, and I was really overjoyed that my predecessors agreed to come and share with me and I was able to share with them uh, where I was hoping and where the organisation was hoping to move and their expertise and their knowledge and their listening was invaluable and I have thanked them and we meet again in January and I will thank them once again because nobody has all the answers but together we can move things forward. But there was also recurring questions. What is the essence of Mother's Union? And what does it mean to be a member? How can we engage with our membership? What are the big priorities? How can we capture, share, and celebrate activities and achievements? A Worldwide Council earlier this year in March 2017, as you can see, there's an awful lot of people stood talking and in conversation with each other. At Anne Greenon in Ireland, the Worldwide Board and Worldwide Provincial Presidents openly discussed ideas, offering genuine opportunity to hear views and seek support and work out ways of turning dreams into reality. Mother's Union, to be stronger, to be more united, building together for the future, to listen and hear from the membership what is important to members on the ground, to have our future firmly and strategically grounded in community, to commit to having global conversations. The global leadership meeting, the worldwide trustee board and the provincial presidents around the world sat and tried to work a way forward, keeping prayer at the focus to co-create a future. And Maloa was born. Mother's Union listens, observes and acts. And Antonia will, in the months to come, be sharing with you this new initiative and how you, as members on the ground, will be able to engage. But some of the objectives of Maloa, space to listen to God, identify his purpose for Mother's Union into the future and listen to but also respect every voice. To develop a truly global strategic plan for Mother's Union to 2020 and beyond. To be able to affirm clearly the priorities for action and advocacy for 2019 to 2021. To foster ownership of the organisation by all, including global contributions. Strengthening mutual understanding and relationships across the family of the worldwide Mother's Union. To have a clear framework and direction for Mother's Union globally beyond 2020. 
Mother's Union at every level will be better equipped to listen to the voices of the people we serve. It's also hoped that individually and together, members across the world will be inspired and indeed re-energised in their relationships with God and each other, enabling them to more effectively make a difference in their church and in their community. The first Nullawa gathering has already happened in the West Indies. I'm looking forward in next week to hear that report, to see how it's worked, to see what plans we have for the future. A living faith, bringing hope and showing love. That's my hope and my prayer for this organisation going back to our founder, but moving it forward to 2017 and beyond. I've asked myself this question so many times. What is the Lord asking of you? So friends, what is the Lord asking of you in the province of Canterbury? in the Diocese of Guildford, so that we are a movement of people and a global family. I believe he's saying to you, don't remain static. Continue to evolve and adapt. Walk together with the wider church. Be brave. Be prepared to step out of the boat and try new things. Remain focused and yet remain faithful to the Mother's Union aim and objectives. Encourage new members. Don't put obstacles in their way. Encourage new ways of being Mother's Union. Branch meetings can be wonderful, but they're not for everybody. I love being part of a branch. And I was sharing yesterday with a group that, as well my president, I'm actually not at home very much. And somebody did say to me, how does your husband cope? And I said, well, he's got a picture of me. <laughs> and when I get home, he's got me. But he actually said to somebody, you know, the picture's much quieter than the other thing. <laughs> but it's a journey that we walk together. David supports me as I support him, as you support your spouses, as you support your family. It's a wonderful journey and it's a wonderful pri privilege to be part of somebody else's life in whatever way. But this lady was saying to me, you know, we can't get members, Lynn. You know, you, you keep on saying we've got to get members, but we can't get members. So I said, it is difficult. I said, but you know, branch meetings aren't for everybody. And she said, we've even changed the time of our meetings. We used to meet at half past two. We now meet at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what's even worse? The young, young women still won't come. And I said, well, you know, they might be picking their children up from nursery. Well, they could get somebody else. What about school? Well, I'm sure somebody would pick their children up. I said, well, what about if they're working? Well, oh, have a day off. <laughs> attitudes. We need to change our attitudes. We need to look outwards and say, how can we walk the journey of the Christian faith? How can you and I engage? My hope and my prayer for each of our four million members, wherever they live in the world, to remain faithful to their ministry and calling and feel empowered. To serve God and his church through service to Mother's Union as they continue to walk Mary Summer's footsteps through word, prayer and action. Remember our Founder's Prayer. 
all this day, O oh Lord. Let me touch as many lives as possible for thee. And every life I touch, do thou by thy spirit quicken, whether through the word I speak, the prayer I breathe, or the life I live. If you and I walk that prayer every second of our lives, we will be transformed and those around us will also be transformed. And God in his heaven will smile and say, wonderful, faithful servants. I am passionate about that. Thank you. wisely 
it will be used carefully and so much more work will be enabled. Bless you. Thank you. Um, Jane, would you like to come up, please? This is Jane Norris, um, and the reason Jane is coming up is because we have a very special member. Well, we're all special members, we know that. Uh, but we have someone who we believe, and I'm sure I'm going to be corrected again because I always get corrected. We have the person we believe is the oldest member in the diocese, and that is Flora Turner, who's sitting here, who was 102 on Monday. So, wonderful having them to see me so often and do so much for me. Anyway, thank you one and all. Thank you very much.
but there's one more very small thing in Don't Sit Down. <laughs> um, just before she talks, and I thought this was probably a better moment, it's, it's a good moment, just to say a thank you to Lynn for coming, and I just have a really small gift from Guildford Diocese to you um, to say thank you for, for being with us today and for three days. <laughs> It's been fantastic to actually listen to Lynn talking both yesterday and today, to hear about the work that Mother's Union have been involved in, both here in the UK and abroad, work like um, activism against gender-based uh, mutilation and, and violence, the work that they've done at home in the prisons, but also things like wrapping um, babies in love. Poor, uh, parents that have lost children, the Mother's Union have been involved in actually creating blankets for these babies so that when the babies come out they're wrapped in love and given to their parents. Uh, it's been really inspiring and it's been lovely to actually be able to stop and think about what we can do at a local level, at a diocesan level as well, to join in with these different initiatives. I've been a member actually for a few years now. I was a member in my previous church and then two years ago I was asked to become the diocesan chaplain and that's been a real eye-opener actually because the ladies in my previous church did a fantastic job supporting all the children's ministry and the toddlers clubs and things like that we used to do but it's only since I've actually been a chaplain to the diocese and I've been involved in the trustees meetings that I've actually realised how much work we actually do here in the diocese. So I've heard about the work that we've done in the prisons, both actually in kind of craft groups, but also supporting the prisoners as they're visiting their husbands, sorry, the, supporting the wives who are visiting their husbands in prison. So Mother's Union are involved in actually running the crashes in the prison so that they can visit and have some kind of quality time to talk together and the children are happy, they're not bored, and so they can wander in and out and talk to their family. So important in this environment to actually keep the families together as much as we can so that they continue and, and have contact with each other. Well, today we've um, been really honoured to have Bishop Joe here presiding with us and um, after our members meeting with Lynn Tenby this morning um, and we focused really on the work of Mother's Union but we also focused on how we can reach out and how we can walk the walk with young people. So rather than actually saying, you know, oh, how can we get young people to join us? We've been looking at how we can actually reach out and how we can walk alongside people and help them in their Christian journey and be involved in their lives. Fantastic morning here at, at Ashdead because of Lynn Temby's visit with us. Real honour for Guildford to have, to have the worldwide president here. I teased her that, you know, even though Donald Trump may travel to Korea and China, he's not the worldwide president. <laughs> I, think, um, I think Mother's Union stretches it to 83 countries. Uh, and, and to engage with those and pray with the women in those circumstances and across, it, it's, across the church is just such a privilege, that's what it's all about. So we've had a service here this morning, uh, a Eucharist, uh, and we've, we've celebrated together. Uh, I think it was the annual meeting a year ago, they asked me to come and speak, uh, and they asked me, and I realised I'd never been invited to be a member, it had never actually crossed my mind. So that was my big moment. The church is made up of, is it two thirds women? And, and certainly across the world in places where I've worked, um, and particularly I've worked in East and South Africa where my heart's been deeply touched and changed. It, it's been work of the Mother's Union or its partner organizations. It's women coming together to empower one another uh, to live the love of Jesus, to laugh the love of Jesus, and to share the love of Jesus. And sometimes they're doing that against phenomenal odds. And I have to say, I just take my hat off and think, my goodness, if Jesus can empower that, then I want to be part of it. <laughs>